afternoon, and just glad to be back together in the Lord's house this evening. Let's stand together, page 344, my hope is in the Lord is a great thing, that we can trust in Him, it's not just a hope, it's a promise that we can trust in Him for His salvation. Page 344, my hope is in the Lord. My hope is in the Lord who gave himself for me and paid the price of all my sin at Calvary. For me he died, for me he lives, and everlasting life and light he frees. Good evening. It's good to see each of, this, of you this evening. And uh, nice warm weather out there. I saw the Master Club kids are playing outside, so you know it's getting warm when that's happening. And uh, so looking forward to a good night for them and for us up here. Chris, would you mind opening us a word of prayer this evening? Amen.
our hymn of the month this month is March. Lord of my heart, page 471, and some great words of this song, and I trust that God is truly the Lord of your heart, not just the one who has brought you salvation, but is truly ruling over your heart and everything that you do. And this might be familiar to some of you, but we'll learn it together throughout this month. Page 471, Lord of my heart. Jesus, my heavenly Father, King of the heavens you are, loving and caring, forgiving, you are the Lord of my heart, Lord of my heart, Savior divine, you shed your blood, suffered and died, giving me life, you gave your all, Lord of my heart. Jesus, my wonderful Savior, King of all kings, rule on high. Lord of all glory forever, you are the Lord of my life, Lord of my heart, Savior divine. You shed your blood, suffered and died, giving me life, you gave your all, Lord of my heart. Jesus, my rock of salvation, my refuge, my fortress, my God, hope of the Lord and all nations, you are the Lord of my life, Lord of my heart, Savior divine, you shed your blood, suffered and died, giving me life, you gave your all, Lord of my heart. Let's sing just that chorus once more together. Lord of my heart, Savior divine, you shed your blood, suffered and died, giving me life, you gave your all, Lord of my heart. Amen. Good singing. Men, would you please come forward? We'll take this evening's tithe and offering. And we mentioned it this morning, but keep the Hilbert family in prayer as Michael lost his uncle uh, this weekend. And uh, keep them in prayer if you would. Well, Ben, would you mind praying for us? Thank you for that. Well, just a few announcements this evening. Uh, we have our security team, the Sheepdogs. They are getting ready to meet back up again. And so if you'd like to be part of that group, there's a sign-up sheet on the back table. And then there's also going to be a meeting next Wednesday, right after the evening service. And uh, they'll just go over some details, get you squared away there. So if you'd like to be part of that ministry, just sign up and then see them next Wednesday. All right. And then also we are uh, fine-tuning our prayer chain, and so if you'd like to be on that prayer chain, you can sign up if you're not. And uh, also if your number has changed over the years, uh, you can adjust your net, uh, number on that back paper back there, and uh, that way everyone will know uh, who to get a hold of, all right? And then our Senior Saints, we're having an activity on March 17th. We're going to meet here. We're going to leave here. 
at 12.15 on uh, that Thursday. And so be here before that, and uh, we'll head down. Kamak Station's a, a great little restaurant over there, kind of towards Muncie uh, a little bit. So that'll be a fun uh, afternoon over there, all right? And then uh, we started them last week, but it's not too late to join. We are still doing our small groups on Wednesday nights. And I was in the back with the team, so I didn't get to see it. Uh, but I heard it was a great night. I heard everybody enjoyed it. And uh, you can still join. We still have some books. So if you'd like to, come see us. And uh, we'd love for you to be part of that. All right? Well, that's all the announcements I have. So Pastor Joe, why don't you come and lead us another song? Our final song this evening is page 679. And it fits along with the theme as we've been singing together is God is trustworthy. We can trust in Jesus. Our, our hope is in him. He deserves to be the Lord of our life, but it's also, it's just a sweet thing that we can trust in the Lord. Let's stand together. Page 679, tis so sweet to trust in Jesus as we sing together. Page 679. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus just to take him at his word, just to rest upon his promise, just to know saith the Lord Jesus, Jesus how I trust him, how I prove him more and more Jesus, Jesus precious Jesus oh for grace to trust him on that third as the last yes tis sweet to trust in Jesus just from sin and self to cease just from Jesus simply taking life and rest and joy and peace Jesus Jesus how I trust him how I proved him more and more Jesus Jesus precious Jesus oh for grace to trust him more amen you may be seated
praise the Lord for salvation. And it's not the modern way. It's rejected nowadays, but thankful that God's word is still truth and his salvation is still available. We're going to be in Luke chapter 10 this evening, continuing on with parables. Luke chapter number 10. How many have ever lost something before? Isn't that the worst? I mean, I, I lose things every morning. I'm losing something. And on my way out the door, I basically do an airport security pat down to make sure I have, I mean, phone, keys, wallet. You got your basics. You're, you're searching all over the place. And if you can't find those, you hit a, a quick panic mode. Where's my phone? Where are my keys? I can't get to work without my keys. Where's my wallet? I can't get to work without my wallet because I got to drive and I'll get pulled over. Just hap that, That's going to happen. If you forget your wallet, that'll be the day you get pulled over for something. It, but when we forget things, we start to panic a little bit. I remember the biggest panic I probably ever had while forgetting something. We are on a trip. It was a family trip and we were going to the Bahamas. And uh, it was a cruise and we had never been on a cruise before. I, and cruises are awesome. Because there's food. It was great. <laughs> Loved the cruise, and, and it was great. I mean, all of us, we had never been on a cruise before, and so all of us were nervous. We were all doing research on a cruise, and so all of us had these nice little patches right behind our ear, just in case we get seasick. So we had our seasick patches. We had our, our passports, even though we were going to the Bahamas, and uh, that's within America. And, uh, and we were just getting everything prepared for this. And there are certain things you just can't prepare for. We go to the, the Bahamas one day, and we're out, and we decide to go swimming in the ocean, which is great. I, I love the ocean. I love swimming in the ocean. So we go out to the ocean. We start wading a little bit. And we don't go far out because I'm not a good swimmer. And so we, we stay in the shallow portions, and, and we're, we're swimming and enjoying the ocean for a little while. And then we decide, all right, let's walk around the rest of the island, see what things have to offer. And we're going through, and I remember... Oh no. I started checking my pocket. Because whatever shorts I was wearing to go swimming in also had pockets, which is great. They, they keep things for you until they don't. Because I was looking in my pockets and I could not find my wallet. We're in the Bahamas and I want to buy souvenirs. I want to buy those, those fake trinkets that are, are shipped in from China, but they say they made hand, like by hand. And I wanted to buy some of those things and I did not have my wallet. And you know the last time I remembered having my wallet? When I was swimming in the ocean. So I'm thinking, jellyfish stole it, right? <laughs> my, my wallet is gone. I'm never getting that wallet back. You lose something in the ocean. It's, it's done for. It's getting swallowed. It's getting cast out to sea. Once it goes in the ocean, it's probably not coming back to you. And so we were, we were searching. We went back to where we swam in that shallow area. and We're digging everywhere. We're looking everywhere we can. Nothing. No wallet. What a surprise. You can't find your wallet in the ocean, right? And so, so we, uh, we just couldn't find it. And so there was a little check-in desk over by the beach area, and we decided to go, hey, maybe someone just happened to see this wallet float along shore and they picked it up maybe right and so we can tell you what the end of that's going to be we go to the kiosk we ask hey have you seen a wallet and they said yeah we do and uh, I was like well is it is it mine and they're like well you, you kind of have to give us your information what's your name what's your uh, all these different things and I told them and then they they looked at it and said this is your wallet and they gave it back to me. I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe, first of all, that I lost my wallet in the ocean. I mean, dad's going to kill me, all right? To this day, I don't think he knows this story, all right? And, and I remember losing that wallet, and I was just, I was in full panic mode. And then we find this wallet, and I just couldn't believe it. And I remember as we were talking, they said, some good Samaritan must have turned this wallet in. Because most people that find wallets, especially when you're out in those areas of the country, you're not getting it back. The chances of someone finding the wallet and giving it back to you are as good a chance as you throwing your wallet in the ocean and getting it back. All right? I beat the odds twice in one day. And they said, man, this person, whoever turned it in, they must be a good Samaritan. And we hear that phrase pretty often. We see it in news headlines where someone saves the day, they rescue a cat from a tree, or they, they find something and give it back to someone else. They, they help someone as they see that they're struggling, and we, we see it in the headline news. This person is a good Samaritan. 
And when I was younger, I remember before looking at some things, I thought good Samaritan just, Samaritan was another word for citizen. Samaritan was another word for individual or a person, type of person. But Samaritan is actually a people group. And for the most part, they're usually not referred to as very good. But that changes, our perspective changes when we look at Luke chapter 10. And Jesus gives us a parable that changes the name of Samaritans forever. Now we hear Good Samaritan and we automatically think, wow, they have done some great act of kindness. They have gone out of their way in some way to show love. And that's because in Luke chapter 10, Jesus gives us a parable about a certain Samaritan. And let's look at that parable this evening in Luke chapter 10. And we're going to start in verse 29. There's a question that sparks this parable. And this is a lawyer or someone who studies the law of Moses, not really a, a lawyer like we would think of today in studying the civil law and criminal law. This lawyer here, he would have been studying the law of Moses, the religious law of the Israelites. And he's questioning Jesus. And we'll pick up in verse 29. It says, but he, willing to justify himself, said unto Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Who is it I'm supposed to be loving? Who qualifies? And Jesus answering said, notice Jesus didn't give just a straightforward answer. He doesn't say, everyone's your neighbor. Love people. That's not what Jesus said. Jesus now gives an entire parable to explain this to this lawyer. So let's read this parable. And there's a lot of deep things in this parable. We won't take a ton of time explaining the parable itself. But let's start reading in verse 30. Verse 30 says, And Jesus answering said, a certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho. Right away, this would have been a familiar thing for these Israelites. They, they would have recognized there is a treacherous road that goes from Jerusalem to Jericho. It's a real road. It's a commonly traveled road. And the difference well, was pretty high. They did go down to Jericho because there was a 4,000-mile height difference from Jerusalem down to Jericho. And that height difference took place in 17 miles. 17 miles from Jerusalem to Jericho, 4,000 mile height difference. Or 4,000 feet, yeah, 4,000 feet difference. So, you can imagine, you're going 17 miles one direction, but along the way, you're going down 4,000 feet. Now, I lived in West Virginia for a while, and the roads in West Virginia were absolutely terrible. West Virginia was voted to have the worst roads in America, and the city that I lived in, Morgantown, had the worst roads voted in West Virginia. I mean, I, ha I literally could say I lived in the city that has the worst roads in the entire nation. You know why they were so bad? It's because it was mountainous. Everywhere you went, it was winding around. There were sharp turns. It was going down steep. And so you can imagine in this stretch that is going down steep for 17 miles, there's going to be some winding roads. It's going to be a little treacherous. But not only is it a difficult road to navigate because you might fall off a cliff and because you, you might just not be able to stop, you just keep going down, but because also along the sides there's caves and, and ravines to where people would hide, and this was commonly known as a, a bloody path. And this is where people, we were robbers, highwaymen, they would hide out in those caves and areas, and it was a perfect spot. So this is a treacherous road. This is a real road that the Jews would have been immediately thinking about. It would have connected with them. So he's going down this road, and he fell among thieves. And they stripped him of his raiment and wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. So this man had a rough time. He lost everything he had, including his health. Uh, he's in rough shape. If someone doesn't rescue this guy quick, he's going to die. He's going to bleed out, or he's going to be uh, torn up by wild animals where he can't defend himself. Whatever it might be, this guy is in bad, bad shape. But in verse 31, some hope comes along. Verse 31, and by chance, there just happened to be. There came down a certain priest that way. Boy, that's good news. You're in rough shape, and who comes along? A priest, surely, this man is going to help them. And as the Jews are hearing this story, they have to be thinking to themselves, well, he's out of trouble. 
he, he's, he's going to be just fine. Because the priest would have known that this was a responsibility that they had. Because remember, they knew the law of God. So they would have remembered a couple certain laws, maybe like Leviticus 19.34 that says if you see a stranger in need, that you do whatever it takes to meet their need. Maybe they would have remembered the, the law of Exodus 23.4 where it says that if you find your enemy's donkey in a ditch, you save the donkey, let alone the man that owns the donkey. Maybe they were thinking of Psalm 37.21 that the righteous is gracious and he gives. Or they could have been thinking about Micah 6.8. You know what is good to do justly and to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly. And so if anyone would have been a help to this man, it would have been a priest. They would have known the Old Testament law that you have to be hospitable and and help people. And and when there's someone in need, you, you fix that problem. But notice what he does. And when he saw him. He passed by on the other side. He literally goes out of his way, the opposite direction, to have nothing to do with him. Verse 32, and likewise a Levite. A Levite would have known the same thing. The Levite was not necessarily a priest, but they were priestly in their lineage. And because of that, they were usually helping out in the temple. They would help the priests. They, they knew the law. The Levites knew the law. And he was at that place. And came and looked on him and passed by on the other side. He does the same thing. He goes the opposite direction. There have been many commentaries written on this certain parable, this passage of scripture. And they all start debating, well, why would this priest not come and, and save this person? What was, what was this priest thinking? Maybe the priest was thinking, if I go and help them, then the same thing's going to happen to me. I'm going to go down to that spot and, and someone's going to come and get me. Or maybe the priest could have been thinking, I don't want to touch something that that would defile me. If I'm going to the temple, I don't want to touch something that's going to defile me. Or or maybe they didn't just just uh, just didn't want to to have that possibility. You know what I say to that? As far as what was this man thinking? He wasn't thinking anything. You know why? Because this man didn't exist. This is not a real person. This, This is a story. This is a parable. And so to write three pages in a commentary about what this priest possibly would have been thinking is a little bit crazy because the priest wasn't real. He was part of the parable. And so I don't know what the priest was thinking. He he wasn't thinking anything. But I know what the priest did. I know what the Levite did. They saw someone in need, and they went away from it. They didn't follow what they were supposed to be doing. It it twists the thinking where if anyone's going to help him, it would be a priest or a Levite. But no, they didn't do a thing. They didn't show any kindness. So we get to the third man. Verse 33, it says, But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was. Now we know a little bit about the history of Samaritans and Jews, but let me just say, Jews and Samaritans hate each other. Jews and Samaritans were polar opposites. They wanted nothing to do with one another. The reason why is because Samaritans, they were part of the, originally of the northern kingdom of Israel. And when Babylon came and, and really just took over everything, those people stayed in that northern kingdom. And they started marrying and, and living with Gentiles. And so it would have been a mixed nationality of Gentile and Jew. And we see this hatred all throughout. When you read the book of Nehemiah, there's a group of people who want to help build the wall with Nehemiah. They're Samaritans. And the leader of the group is Sanballat. And you know what the Jews said? No, thanks. We want nothing to do with you. I don't care what you're coming to do. We want nothing to do with you. You've defiled yourself. You're, you're not even serving the living God. You're, you're part of a, a separate people group as far as we're concerned. We want nothing to do with you. We might remember that when Jesus goes and he talks to the woman at the well, he goes through Samaria. And remember that takes everyone by surprise because Israelites don't even walk through Samaria. That's how much they hated the land. They would not even put their feet on the dirt of Samaria. That's how much the Jews and, and the Israelites, they hated the Samaritans. And so we see that, and so this would cause people to stop and think. A Samaritan, someone that we're complete enemies with, someone we want nothing to do with, what does he do? As he journeyed, he came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion on him. And went to him, 
and bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, and set him on his own beast, and brought him to an inn, and took care of him. And on the morrow when he departed, he took out two pence, and gave them to the host, and said unto him, Take care of him, and whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come again, I will repay thee. Wow. So this man that we would have thought we wanted nothing to do with, he changes our thinking. And that brings us to our first point tonight. We see in this parable, we see a picture of love. The question is, who is my neighbor? And Jesus then gives us a picture of a Samaritan showing love. He doesn't answer the question right off. He doesn't say, here's who your neighbor is. He doesn't say, here's the people who meet the list of qualifications. He flips the question. And he gives a parable. So and now, instead of the question being, who is my neighbor, it's an entirely different question. It reminds me a little bit of Looney Tunes. Any of you Looney Tunes fans? I love Looney Tunes. Yes, this whole row right here. Great. And I love Bugs Bunny. Bugs Bunny has always been one of my favorites. And, and I love Daffy as well. All right? And so I, I love, love Bugs and Daffy. I love their, their back and forth that they have. And this reminds me of, you, it, you almost see this every like fifth episode. You'll see Daffy and Bugs face to face. And one of them is saying, rabbit season. Daffy's saying, rabbit season. Because Elmer Fudd's coming out to hunt them. And so, so Daffy's saying, rabbit season. And Bugs is saying, duck season. And they're going back and forth, rabbit season, duck season, rabbit season, duck season. And all of a sudden, Bugs says, rabbit season. And Daffy starts saying, Duck season. <laughs> and Bugs gives up. Because now, Daffy's saying exactly what he wanted him to say. He switches the conversation. He takes it a new direction. He, he kind of puts a different spin on it. And Bugs changes things up. And that's what Jesus does here. Instead of answering the question, who is your neighbor? He changes the question into, what kind of person are you? Instead of what status of people are worthy of my love, it's now, how can I become the type of person that shows love regardless of status? He changes our thinking. He doesn't answer the question who your neighbor is. He starts looking at the question, how are you loving people? Are you really showing love? And then he gives us this picture of a Samaritan who we would not look at as a neighbor if you were the Jews. And he gives us the picture of love. He says it's not about status. It's not about race. It's about how you actually show love. And he gives us this picture of love. And as we look at what this Samaritan does, I want us to look at a couple of qualities of the love that this Samaritan showed. First, I want us to see that he was sacrificial. He was sacrificial. It says when he came, he saw him, he had compassion on him or love on him, as we are supposed to have, and went to him, bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, and set him on his own beast. Right away, we see that this man, he takes his own things. That's his own oil. That's his own wine, and he's pouring them. It doesn't just say that, that he kind of dabs it on. He is, he is outpouring his own resources to help this man. He lifts him up using his own strength, his, his, own, his, his own beast, puts him on, the, on his beast. Then takes him to the inn, and you know what he does? is He pays for this man to stay at the inn. It, it says here two pence, and in actual Greek it's two denarii, which would pay for four to six weeks worth of stay at an inn. So this man, sacrificially, he's giving of his own time. He's giving of his own resources, and he is sacrificing things that he has. He's in the middle of a journey. He's in the middle of a trip, but he stops, and he stays overnight. And this man took the things that he owned. He said, they're yours. I sacrificed them for you. Boy, it's tough to love that way, isn't it? It's tough to love sacrificially. It's easy to love when it costs me nothing. When it's just, okay, sure, I'll do this for you, but we don't really go out of our way. And we see that this man, he loved sacrificially. Not only did he love sacrificially, he loved generously. He went above and beyond the call of being hospitable. He, he puts everything that he has. He pays for four to six weeks. And then beyond that, he says, and 
for anything that he costs over that while he's staying there. When I come back through, I'll settle up with you. He says, I'm going to pay for four to six weeks, but if he needs more, I'll take care of it. I'm taking care of this man. He gives generously. That one's a tough one too, isn't it? We just, we'll meet the need. We'll, we'll help where we need to help, but, but I'm not going to give more time than someone else gives. Uh, I'm not going to spend extra money on this than anyone else would. But this man gives generously. He also gives to the unlovely. This would have been a person, it would have been understood that this person was a Jew in this story. And the Samaritans hated the Jews as much as the Jews hated the Samaritans. And the Samaritan goes and he shows him love. He shows him kindness. Some people are hard to love, aren't they? We can just admit it. There's some people that maybe our personalities just, they don't click very well. Or maybe they just rub us the wrong way or, or whatever it might be. Maybe that they mistreat us in a certain way. There are some people that it takes a little bit more effort to love. It can be difficult sometimes. And this Samaritan goes above and beyond in showing love to someone who would have been considered an enemy. That's how he shows love. He also showed love without recognition. No one praises him for this. The innkeeper doesn't stop and say, you're a great guy. We don't see anything like that. This is just these two men alone. It wasn't like there was a, a crowd watching on this road down to Jericho. No, no one saw this love. No one gave recognition. It was a love that was completely selfless. I, I remember growing up, and we would put chairs away in that gym. And I remember we would always have a competition with some of us teenagers, me and Brandon and, and Tony and Cody and a couple others. And we would start putting away chairs. You know what we would do? How many chairs can I carry at once? Right? Right? Uh, and we would, you know, we'd start and we'd just start putting them side by side until we have our arms completely full of these chairs. And we'd be looking, hey, anybody see how many chairs I got? You see how many I got? I got two, right? And, <laughs> and I remember we would go through that. I don't remember who won. It's probably Brandon. But as we were carrying those chairs and we were looking around, the purpose of what we were doing was to serve, right? We're taking down what we're taking down. We're getting ready for the next thing. We're helping the church out. But the whole time, we are looking around saying, who sees what I'm carrying? How many chairs do I got? What's my value in chairs today? And as we started looking around, that people would see our acts of service. We don't see that in the Samaritan. And so Jesus gives us a picture of love. Instead of answering the question, who is my neighbor? He questions him back, how well are you actually loving people? All people are your neighbor. Are you really showing them love? And this love that the Samaritan shows, that would be a pretty high standard, would it not? The sacrificial, generous, without recognition, selfless love that he showed. And this love was remarkable. And thinking to ourselves, there have been times where, you know, maybe I've given a couple bucks to a homeless guy I've seen in Indianapolis or or in the subway, or whatever it might be, and uh, give a couple bucks, and, and we start thinking, man, I'm pretty good. That makes us feel good about ourselves. I gave a couple dollars here. I helped out with the thing here. Have any of us ever gone to this extent where I am paying for four to six weeks worth of in stay? I'm giving up everything I have. I, I, I'm giving them the best. I'm going above and beyond in service. We can probably look at ourselves and say, I've, I've probably never showed someone that extent of love. And actually, you have. You know who you do that for? Yourself. You show yourself that type of love every day. Every day. We show ourselves that type of love. Give me whatever I need. I'm hungry. I'm going to go get food. I need a place to stay. I'm staying in a hotel tonight if I'm on the road. Or I got a house to stay in. Whatever I need. Get me the best doctor. Get me to the best place. Give me the best care I can get. We buy car insurance policies. We buy health insurance policies. We buy life insurance policies. We buy home insurance. We buy all of these things that takes care of who? Takes care of us and our possessions and what we have. 
This type of love that Samaritan showed, we show that type of love every day to ourselves. But how often do we show that type of love to anyone else? And the type of love we are to show is the love that we would give to ourselves. Matthew twenty-two thirty-nine 39 says, And the second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Leviticus nineteen eighteen, 18, Thou shalt not avenge nor bear any grudge against the children of thy people, but thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. We see this picture of love, but it's also not just a picture, it's a commandment given all throughout Scripture that you would love other people the way that you love yourself, sacrificially, and and just giving them everything they need. And so Jesus takes his time, he answers this question by flipping it. And he, he lets us think about it in a new light on not if who is your neighbor, but how well are you actually showing love? But this is not the only question that Jesus is answering with this parable. This conversation with this lawyer goes back all the way to verse 25. We're going to look at that. And this parable, it it really does two in one. There's lots of different explanations or maybe illustrations, but this gets two giggles from one tickle. It lets, lets us pull two weeds with one yank, water two plants with one hose, flutter two hearts with one look, mash two potatoes with a fork, kill two birds with one stone. That's what this parable does. It's a two-in-one shot. It answers one question at the end of the conversation, but it also answers the initial question at the beginning of the conversation. So our first point is we see a picture of love. There's a couple more points as we go back to verse 25. This lawyer is talking. It says, Behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him. This lawyer, he was not genuine. This lawyer did not really care. He was tempting Jesus, trying to get Jesus to trip up or not say the right thing or get him to maybe affirm what the lawyer wanted to be right. Tempted him, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said unto him, What is written in the law? How readest thou? This is the guy who has studied the law, and he knows the law of Moses. So Jesus responds to him, Well, you've read the law. What do you think it says? That's how Jesus responds. And this young man, this lawyer, he actually answers correctly. He answering said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy strength, with all thy mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. And he said unto him, Thou hast answered right. This do, and thou shalt live. So the lawyer gives the right response. Love God with everything you have, and love people as you love yourself. And Jesus says, That's right. Go and do it, and you'll have eternal life. That's how Jesus responds. And we see a proud heart. That's our second point in this lawyer. So I want us to see how the lawyer responds. He says, but he, willing to justify himself, he asked the second question that we've already gotten the response to, and who is my neighbor? What should have this lawyer's response been? He he hears what the law says, and Jesus says to go and do it. And this lawyer doesn't address it. And his heart is proud. We see it already in verse 25. His heart is calloused over. He wants nothing to hear about the teachings of Jesus. He doesn't really care what Jesus has to say. His heart is calloused. If you would hold up your hand, whether whatever whatever hand you write with, if I hold up this hand, you'll see on this finger right here, there's a bump. My other hand doesn't have it. It's not there. Just on this hand, there's a bump. Why is that? From writing with a pen. All those times I would get in trouble and sit at my desk. I will not talk in class, right? And, and it calloused that knuckle up. And you can see the whole bump right there. And when I poke on it, it would be hard to hurt that spot right there. Why? It's calloused. It's hard. A picture of this lawyer's heart, he's calloused over. He's hard to the things, the actual truth of God. He's heard the law plenty of times. He, he knows the law of Moses. He knows who God is. He knows the commandments, but he doesn't know God. Why? Because his heart is calloused. It's hard. And we see a proud heart. When he hears Jesus respond this way, go and do it, his response shouldn't have been to, to be defensive or to try to justify himself or sway the question another way. When he hears what the law truly is, What should his response be? God, have mercy on me. Because I haven't loved God perfectly with everything I have all the time. 
Uh, I haven't loved my neighbor as myself all the time. And instead of coming to grips with the teaching that Jesus has been saying, he tries to continually justify himself and tries to flip the question. He has a proud, proud heart. He wants nothing to do with the things of God. Before we get into the piercing truth of what Jesus is answering with this, this other question of how do I have eternal life, I want us to see a calloused, proud heart. And many times we can get to this point that this lawyer was at where we know the right answers, and we know even that we haven't lived up to them, but we do nothing about it. We're confronted with truth every Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, in our devotions throughout the week, but there are times when we hear the truth so often, we become calloused, and we don't let it actually affect us. And that's where this man was. He heard the truth. He, he knew he didn't meet up to the standards of God's law, and yet he's trying to justify himself, to think that he's okay, when in actuality his heart was just hard. And so we see a proud heart. And that brings us to where Jesus answers this first question, the other bird with the stone, a piercing truth. What is the piercing truth? As he describes this love of the Samaritan, we can't help but look at the love the Samaritan has and say, I don't have that type of love all the time for all people. Because that Samaritan went above and beyond. He loved that broken man as he would love himself. And what Jesus is getting across with this parable is, to have eternal life, you can't keep the law by yourself. It is impossible. You can't love perfectly all the time because we are sinful. And what you should be doing, instead of trying to justify yourself, you should know this piercing truth that you can't justify yourself. There's nothing you can do. Here's the picture of perfect love, and you don't measure up. And that's what Jesus is getting across to this lawyer is, how do you have eternal life? It's not through the law. It's not through what you can do, because you can't do it. And the truth that Jesus is giving is that you must cry out for help. We need God's help. I remember when I was in camp, and uh, they had all these water tables out in the kitchen one day at camp. And uh, I was a camper at this time, and so we were, we were going up to the water table and had all these cups of water, and, and we were kind of the last ones to get there, and there's only maybe eight to ten cups left on this table. And uh, I'm there with a couple friends, and I forget who said it, but they said, hey, I got a challenge for you. I said, okay, I'm in. I'm always up for a challenge. I said, I want you to put both your hands down on the table. I said, okay. So I put both my hands on the table. They said, all right, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to put a cup of water on each hand, and you have to be able to, to turn them over without spilling them. So that's what I do. I, I put one hand down, and they put a cup, and put the other hand down, they put a cup on top. And then they say, all right, good luck, see ya. And I am stuck there in the middle of this cafe with both my hands down and two huge cups of water on top of my hands. And what did I start doing? Help. <laughs> Someone help. Please. Anyone? I'm trapped. I got water holding me down. I don't want to make a mess here. I had to start crying out for help because there is no way I couldn't meet that. I couldn't do it. I just couldn't. I had to cry out. For someone to do it for me. Someone come help me. I need help. That's what Jesus is getting at here is you need help. You can't do it on your own. You're not going to keep the law perfectly and that's why I'm here. And the point of this parable is yes to give us a, a picture of love and how we should love one another. But it's also to give us a piercing truth that we need God's love. Because I can't do it on my own. And it gives us a realization for how much we truly need salvation because of how false, how short we fall. And not just for salvation, but every single day, as a Christian, showing love to those around us, we need to cry for help. When I go through, through life, I realize that even as a Christian, as someone who follows God, as a children of God, I don't love people the way I ought to love them. I don't love God the way I ought to love them. And I need to cry out for help. 
if I don't meet what God desires of me. And that's the truth of this parable. So looking at our own lives, have we accepted this love? The, the truth is that to, to have any chance with God, to, to know that you can go to heaven, to know that you can have eternal life, as this man asked, it can't be through you. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says, For by grace are you saved through faith. And not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Each, to get to heaven, you can't do it. You need Christ's love. And each day we need to realize that I can't do it. I need Christ's help so that I can have this perfect love, this sacrificial love that I would truly love others as myself. Let's close in prayer together this evening. Dear Lord, we thank you for all that you've done for us. Thank you for this truth that you've given to us, that there is a hope of eternal life, but that hope of eternal life is only found in you. God, I ask that you would help us to be thankful for that, knowing that we had to cry out to help for you. We needed your love, not anything we could do in ourselves. God, I ask that you would also help us as we see this picture of perfect love that each and every day in our lives as believers, that we would realize we need your help to love others the way we ought to love them. That we need your help to, to love you the way we ought to love you. God, I ask that you would just help us to have this picture of perfect love in our lives as well. Thank you, thank you once again for the love you've given to us. I ask that you would give us a, a good remainder of this night. Thank you for all that you've done. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Let's stand together. We'll sing a closing song. Page 494. Have thine own way, Lord. His way is that we would love others. His way is that we would love him. And that we would cry out to help in order to accomplish that. May he have his way in our lives. Page 494, have thine own way. Have thine own way. Rich Chen, would you mind closing in prayer this evening?